Hi, I'm Rob Cosm. Welcome to my shop. This is called a dado joint, very common, sometimes referred to as a housing or a trench. Either way, is it a good joint to use? That's what I'm going to discuss, give you some things to think about. Stay with us. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new and you haven't subscribed, please do so. Hit the notification bell so you'll receive alerts when we release a new video. And anytime we use a special tool, we'll always leave a description down below. All right, let's get to work. Just in case you don't know, let's start by defining what it is. A dado joint is a slot that is cut across the grain. So this board, grain runs this way, and the slot is cut perpendicular to it. Now, if you cut that slot parallel to the grain, like that, we typically call it a groove. So the difference being one is across the grain, the other one is with the grain. This is the one we're going to focus on. Okay, so where are they used? Well, essentially anywhere you have two flat panels meeting at a right angle other than at the ends. So in the middle of a panel, something like that, or in a vertical situation. There's a great example right behind me. This is my yet to be finished um, tool cabinet. So all of these vertical dividers are sitting in dados, both top and bottom. Makes it very secure. And then if you look over here, all of these drawers run on piece on dividers and all of these dividers are set into dados on both sides. That's, that is without a doubt the most common use of a dado joint. Okay, let's examine this joint and see where its strengths and weaknesses are. If you're talking about solid wood and you put a divider, say it's a, a bookshelf, into that joint it's a very strong joint in terms of resisting shear force. So pressure coming down like that. You've got to literally break that, that uh, material before this joint is going to fail. However, where it lacks in strength is in shear force, uh, pardon me, is in tension. So when, if any situation where you're, it's trying to pull that piece apart, if all you're relying on is just glue, it's not a very good joint. Why? Well, if you look at this, this is all end grain, all of this surface. And what we know about gluing is that long grain is great, the joint is stronger than the wood itself. The edge grain is great, stronger than the wood itself, but the end grain is very weak. So you have, in this joint, you have end, gr end grain here, and you've got a strip of long grain on both sides. However, when you put it into here, you have long grain making contact with, pardon me, end grain making contact with long grain. And here you have long grain making contact with end grain. So there's nowhere on this joint that you actually have good long grain to long grain glue surface. Now in a close situation like that, the glue will give you a pretty good uh, amount of support but I certainly would not depend on just glue alone if there was going to be any amount of shear force, or pardon me, tensile force on this joint. Particularly if this was a long wide panel made out of solid wood with a tendency to cup, that's just not gonna keep it together. Now plywood, there's a slight exception. If you look at the uh, plywood version of this, what we're looking at is a combination of end grain out there, the very outside edge of the oak, then this is all long grain, then end grain, then long grain, end grain, long grain, and of course long grain on both outside edges. So when that joint, that piece goes into here, you actually have one, two, three bands of long grain going up against all of that long grain. So that's going to be some advantage. If you look over here, you've got a strip of end grain right here, but you've got long grain here, you've got a little bit of end grain out here with the oak. And when that goes in there, you're going to have long grain surface gluing against long grain surface. So in particle board, MDF, or plywood, glue alone actually gives you a fairly decent joint.
how do we strengthen a solid wood dado to make it acceptable and to resist that that uh, weakness of pulling apart under tensile strength. That okay, let's say. tackle this from what we might say crude to fine. In other words, stuff that you just have to build for utilitarian purposes right up to furniture. So what are we going to do to strengthen this dado so that it will not pull apart if there's any pressure applied this way? We've got lots of strength to resist uh, a um, shear force, but we've got to prevent it from pulling apart. The easiest way would be to go in there, use something like this, countersink bit, and drill your, well, you want to match it up to the, to the actual screw that you're using. So you loosen the set screws on either side. And then you want the top of the countersink to match the top of the, of the uh, screw. Right about there. Snug that up. And then you would go in, decide how many screws you need. So on something like this, I would probably put a screw maybe three quarters of an inch in from the ed edge on both sides and maybe one in the middle. Possibly two, but most likely just one. And you want to make sure that you've got lots of screw in this piece. So that's what you're going to do. Now, ugly? Well, yeah, you're seeing screw heads out there. You can dress it up a little bit. You could actually go in, and the first thing you would do would drill a hole a set a set diameter and you're going to make yourself what are called wood plugs i'll show you how you make those it involves something called a plug cutter you'd use this in a drill press and you would go in and you would drill down through and then you simply go over to your bandsaw or handsaw even and just free them up so once you've drilled that hole then you actually you can sometimes you can actually match it up to this diameter outside of there. If not, drill this one first, and it'll always leave you a little bit of a centering point. And then you would go in and finish through there. Put your screw in. Now your screw is going to be sitting down below the surface. Make sure you've got enough material in here that you've got some strength behind that underneath that head. And then you could go in and put in your plug. Now the plugs always come out tapered, so you got to make sure you get that right small in first and glue it in place flush it off and if you're careful and you match up the grain you can almost have it disappear or if you want instead of cutting these through the face you could cut them into the end grain and purposely have it show you could even use a different colored wood if you wanted to but you wouldn't be seeing a screw hit now another option coming from this side would be something called a miller dowel and this is a pretty interesting uh, dowel in terms of uh, if you think of wood dowels this certainly doesn't look like one but it is it is stepped it gives you lots of glue surface the nice thing about it is after you've drilled it it has a special drill so that goes in and again that last bit is going to house this large diameter head but because it's stepped like that when you apply glue the glue doesn't all get shoved down to the bottom like it does with a normal dowel which is the same size diameter all the way down so it's superior in that sense. But the other reason it's superior is because as this air top area right here on the drill bit stops right about there and you start pounding this in, it acts like a nail in that this larger diameter pulls this piece tight to that and make, makes for a nice secure joint. After the glue is dried, you flush that off, clean it up. Now you're going to see the end grain circle of whatever the species of wood is but that is definitely a step up from just seeing a screw hit. So that's what I would call, from crude to a little bit dressed up, securing a dado joint from the outside. Now let's go get one better. Now you might not think of a nail as something used in furniture. However, you'll find antique furniture that was built this way and it stayed together. So how do we use a nail to strengthen this joint, not coming from the outside? Well, we're going to toenail it. And what we're going to do is get the appropriate size nail. That one's actually a little bit too big. And we're going to drive it in like this. You want to be careful that you don't end up coming through the face. That's why I would suggest that you step down a size. Maybe one in the middle would be even better. But you've got one coming from that angle. And then you've got another one beside it coming from the other side like that. 
and that does a really good job of holding that in place. They've got a small head, so you can almost go without even being noticed. Even better than driving them by hand, and by the way, if you're going to drive them by hand, I would suggest that you put a thin piece. I've often taken something like a, uh, a scraper and put that right there, put it in place with some masking tape while you're nailing that in so that you don't accidentally hit and leave marks all over that piece. Might be best to put one on both sides. And then the last thing you would do is take your nail set. And I've gone over and I've ground mine to get an even smaller tip and just go in there and sink those heads down below the surface. The ones on the bottom, don't even need to worry about the ones on the top. Sometimes it can be so small you can hardly even see it. If you had to, you could put a little bit of wood putty in there. A better solution is to use a small nail gun and that nail gun will allow you to go in and very accurately drive those nails at the appropriate angle. That's going to be the biggest concern the first time you do this is you're going to use a nail that's too big and you're going to blow out to the side. You don't want that to happen. And you remember you're not talking about uh, you're not putting this nail in a situation where the fact that it's got a small head is going to be a disadvantage because it's not um, resisting pulling out it, that that is going to be challenged. It's by having them crossed like that that is going to prevent this piece from being able to be pulled apart. And on a joint that wide I would put uh, oh maybe in about a half an inch on either side. Uh, slightly obviously offset one a little more so you don't end up hitting the nail. And then I would probably go another one here Another one here, and another one near that bottom side. And that would do go a long way to holding that joint together. If, as I mentioned, you have a nail gun, you can go in there and use that guide right on the side. Just kind of line that up, and that will show you the, uh, the angle of trajectory of your nail so that you know you're not going to end up going out through the side. And you can go in and just toenail that. And then you may have to come back with your nail set and just put those in down below the surface so they're not noticed. But that's a, I would consider that to be an acceptable way of securing a dado, even in a piece of furniture. Be neat. Okay, from here on out, it's gonna get a little more complicated. It's gonna be a little fancier. In fact, in some cases, it's not going to be seen at all. In one case, the last one we're gonna cover, it's definitely gonna be seen, but it's gonna be made a feature. All right, we can use dowels in another way. So in this situation, what we're going to do is we're going to strengthen this joint by having dowels protruding all along this, the end of this shelf. One, two, three, I'd probably use four. Space them evenly. So before we would put it together, we would go in and we would drill those holes perpendicular to this face. After we drill them, we would then use what are called dowel points or pins, and we would set them in there. Now, if they don't stay in place, if there's not enough friction to hold them, what you can do is take a piece of masking tape, actually any kind of tape, and just put that down in the hole, put the piece of masking tape over it so it holds it in place, but the point goes through the masking tape. Obviously, you'd want to be inside of the width of the piece. Then, with those in place, put your... Put your board in. Now you want to make sure that your pins don't make contact in there until this piece is actually sitting inside the dado. And then when you've got it perfectly lined up, just take a mallet and hit that. And what that will do, I'll just show you real quick. That will leave you a hole. Best to use a brad point bit and best to use your drill press. Then you would go over and you would drill in those, those marked holes. You're going to find out the problem right away is you don't have a whole lot of contact area. Your brad point bit is usually going to stick out to the point where you probably can't come any deeper than that with the point, which means the, dowel hole, the hole itself is probably only going to be about that deep. So all you have is that much surface area. And you do have some long grain surface on the dowel, meeting long grain surface on the hole that you've bored in the, inside this piece, but it's not a ton. In fact, I might even rethink that and go in and put one there. If you really need to be secure, you could put in that many. And that's a lot of work, but 
not the best choice, I don't think, in terms of strengthening the joint. But it is, it is an option, and it's completely hidden after you've assembled this. Okay, I'm not going to talk a lot about this first one, but I'll talk a fair bit about what I think would be your absolute best option. In place of dowels, we could easily go in and use tenons. So you would cut, uh, in this case you'd want to shoulder this, which means I would go in and I would have cut a shoulder on both sides of this piece. That means that this would have been made a little bit thinner, like so. And obviously the data would have to be thinner. So now your joint is going to close tight when this shoulder comes up against this surface. And then you could go in and you could actually make tenons. Maybe one there, one down here, one down here, and a fourth one out here. And now they would have that shoulder on them, so they would only be about that wide. And then you would have to go in and very careful marking cut mortises in the opposite piece and remember too you can't go very far so you don't have a whole lot of surface area. If you're doing them by hand it's going to be difficult even with a hollow chisel mortiser by the time you you uh, you don't want to come all the way through so you're gonna to have to stop somewhere around here which means you're only going to have an effective depth of about that much which isn't a lot for the amount of work it is. What's the better option? Well, something called a through wedge tenon. So, uh, and a lot of folks look at this and they can't quite figure it out, but here's a through wedge tenon. Now this is not in the same orientation they're gonna show you here, but this will give you the idea. So what you have is this piece coming all the way through this piece, but then you have shaped it on the inside so that the mortise is actually sloped like a dovetail and when you put this piece through, you've already made cuts in the tenon before you assemble it. Then you drive wedges in from the opposite side. And when the wedge comes in, it f causes this piece of the tenon to fold over and fill that void. And when the glue dries, one, two, three, four, five pieces of wood become one. Extremely strong. However, the tenon has to run parallel to the grain. So... People look at that and they think, well, how am I going to do that? Well, what you end up is doing is this. You go in and you make your tenons fairly small. I often would do two side by side. And you might have two more here and two more over there. And your wedge would look like this. So this piece, very similar to what we drew on here, you would come in and you'd have your two tenons. Of course, you'd, be, you'd lose that little bit because of your shoulder. And your shoulder's going to come all the way along here. I would have a far less shoulder simply because that would give me more meat on my tenons. But now you would come in, you would remove this material. You'd have to go in and you'd have to cut down uh, you'd have to have a fair, uh, you also would have to lengthen this out too, so your shoulder would be moved back into here somewhere. So what would happen is you'd have this piece removed so that when it comes up, it comes up nice and tight on the front. You don't want to see on a fancy joint, you don't want to see your dado here, so you would stop it, meaning this would, this dado would have been stopped back here somewhere, and then you would have cut this shoulder back so that the two pieces meet looking like that, but actually they go deeper. Now, where's my drawing? So you're back here. You now have a much longer tenon. You're gonna come in and you're gonna cut the material in between. Let's draw our two tenons. So you're gonna come in here and you're gonna cut away this material, and then you would cut all this material until you came to your next two tenons. So all this would be gone, but there's, your shoulder would be right there. So you would still have this material registering in the, in the dado to give it that shear strength to resist any downward force. But those tenons coming all the way through would give it all the force required to prevent it from being pulled apart like that. 
It's a really pretty way of doing it. It's a lot of work. The, it, your accuracy has to be bang on, especially if you had six of them. Can you imagine? It would have to be right on the money. So when you put this together, you're, all six of those line up. Can be done. Use the right tools. It looks fantastic when it is done. It's probably the strongest way to put together that type of a joint. But like I said, it takes some work. Now that we you know, we didn't talk about the sliding dovetail, kind of a little bit of a different uh, application. We'll talk about that in a separate video. As well, we're going to go through and do each of these joints in a separate video, but I wanted to lay out what your options were so you can start thinking about it. We'll get back to it soon. Hi, if you like my work, if you like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. And I've always said better tools make it a whole lot easier. If you click on the icon with the plane and the chisel, it'll take you to our website, introduce you to all of our tools, and also talk to you about our online and in-person workshops. Good luck in your woodwork.